feels like it's been forever since we were here. And it's only been two weeks. Maybe it's just because the youth conference was so long <laughs> and tiring. No? No? Did, did you enjoy it? That was good. All right, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and we'll get started. We'll get into the lesson. Uh, we pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this time that we can come together. Uh, just to be able to open the Word of God and just kind of look at some different things, Lord, that just uh, help us as we walk with you. Lord, to do pray for wisdom and clarity. Lord, just uh, pray that you'd help me to be clear with signs as well. Lord, just uh, want to make sure that we're learning something that, like I said, we could use to help us uh, draw closer to you and just kind of live in this world. Lord, I just pray for your help and your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so before we get into it... Uh, um, I got to set up a couple of signs for those that might watch that are signing um, ethics, E T H I C S ethics, um, and then we're going to talk about situational situation situational ethics, which is situational ethics, which is a huge thing when we're talking about worldview. Um, so what we're talking about ethics. This that's the big subject today. Um, what is ethics? Well, we got a definition to start off of system of moral principles. That's another one, morals, morals, moral principles. A system of rules regulating the actions and manners of men in society. That's from a Webster's Dictionary, 1828 version. Um, the question and sense of the biblical worldview in, and then comparison to the secular worldview becomes who or what becomes the authority in establishing the rules for our conduct. Um, Mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when we look around at society today, it kind of feels like there are no rules. Um, a lot of chaos. Um, and that's what, that's what comes about, honestly, with, with situational ethics. Because every person gets to decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong. I mean, there is no standard. There is no measure. I mean, and, and the other problem with, with, with you know, situational ethics is that it's, it's constantly changing. Well, the good thing for us as Christians is that our foundation is based upon Scripture and based upon God's Word, so there is no change because it doesn't change. I mean, that's what the Bible says uh, yesterday, today, forever. The Bible's still the same. I mean, it's just like His Word lasts forever. And so it's just like, so with that kind of perspective, with the Christian view of ethics, we come from a scriptural foundation. Stephen D. West said, Christian ethics is guided by God's revelation in Scripture above other systems of thought as it seeks to love God and the neighbor in every moral and ethical issue. Um, he, he, I, I was reading an article. He goes on to say that the, the, the highest ethical duty of every Christian is the same as the great commandment. We have to love God. Love God and love man. I mean, that's what it comes down to. In Matthew chapter 22, it says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus said, and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all of thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. And then he said, The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. So everything ethically is based upon this foundation that we are to love God and love men. Um, so no greater measure of ethics than those two things. I mean, everything else that we, and we'll talk more about it as we get into it, but everything else that we follow is based upon those two commands. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, no, we go back to the Ten Commandments. Well, but actually the Ten Commandments are hinged upon those two. Um, the first four to the Ten Commandments are our relationship with God. The second six are our relationship with mankind. It comes back to those principles and those ethics. Um, the secular view of ethics puts man at the center of the decision-making process. <laughs> this is where the problem comes in. This is where we go back all the way to that first lesson where we talked about situational ethics. Um, they don't even call it that anymore. Because that, those words actually cause people to go, yeah, we don't like that so much. They changed the terminology to what is called relativism. All things being relative. All, all things being relative. You know, it's just like, you know, it's whatever, whatever feels good, right? That's what situational eth ethics is, basically. And it's a very dangerous thing. It is very dangerous because um, if I get to decide what's right for me, but you get to decide what's right for you, how do we balance that? 
do I have a higher moral authority than you because I'm me? I mean, and that's kind of what happens in society. It's just like, and so it's just like, so where's the value there? Um, <laughs> The, the BBC website in ethics study says in situational and situational ethics, right and wrong depend upon the situation. <sighs> it says there's no universal moral rules or rights. Each case is unique and deserves a unique solution. Um, situational ethics rejects prefabricated decision. Prescriptive rules, it teaches that the ethical decision should follow flexible guidelines rather than absolute rules and be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. So, um, so one day, it, something may be right, but tomorrow it's wrong. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very good plan to me. Um, doesn't sound like a very good way to make decisions. Um, the other thing is the Bible tells us, Proverbs chapter 16 says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Um, but we know Judges chapter 17, verses 6, and also 21, 25 says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that who was right in his own eyes. That's situational ethics. Um, even going back to the Bible, um, it permits a person to carry out acts that are generally regarded as bad. Okay, such as killing and lying, but if those acts lead to a sufficiently good result, well, then it's not bad, is it? That's, uh, <laughs> uh, is it ever right to do wrong for a good result? I'm, they would say yes. <laughs> Simple example, a man goes to Walmart, steals a Bible, well, it's a good thing, right? Now he has the Word of God. It's a good result. I mean, stealing's wrong, right? Or at least that's what, you know, we're, we're, we are taught to that, that stealing is wrong. But if he's stealing it for a good cause, I mean, so we have to ask some questions. Well, why did he steal it? I mean, did he steal it so he could resell it and make some money? Or did he steal it so he could study it? And what's he going to do with it? And, and maybe, just maybe, if he steals that Bible, he gets saved. Isn't that a good thing? Doesn't that make stealing okay in that situation? Well, uh, actually, situational ethics would say, yeah. But what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, night for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 1 John chapter 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I've taught the kids in my class in fourth grade, it is never right to do wrong, even if it is a good result. It just, it just it doesn't work. Um, well, then we actually come back to a question of, is there a difference between ethics and morals? Um, they both focus on uh, what's right and conduct, but... Sometimes we use them interchangeably, but actually they are different. Um, basically, it comes down to this. Ethics refers to the rules from an external source. Morals talk about an individual principles that are an internal source of right and wrong. So it's kind of a chart there. So um, what are they? Ethics. Ethics are the rules of conduct recognized in respect of a particular class of human actions or a particular group of culture. These are the rules set by either society um, they could be set by, in our situation, the Bible, okay? But that's what the ethics are. But the morals are what we internally decide, okay? So there's a little bit of difference. That's why it says the social system, the external for ethics, it's the internal for morals. Uh, why do we do what we do? Well, with ethics, it's because society says so. With morals, it's because we believe in something being right or wrong. Um, is there any flexibility? Um, with ethics, no. The rules are the rules. But with morals, they would say, well, yeah, there's flexibility because it depends on the situation. Um, <laughs> gray area, lots of it. <laughs> lots of gray area when it comes down to this. Um, are there any examples, um, any conflicts between ethics and moral conflicts? Oh, yeah. Suppose there's a lawyer who becomes a public defender. Okay. Um, ethics, based upon his position as a public defender, says that he has to defend a murderer. Now, within his own heart, he knows that murder is wrong. 
but ethically he is required, actually even by law, to give the best defense he can for the person he's defending. So that situation, his ethics and his morals conflict. What does he do? Well, here's what he does. Don't become a public defender. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's just like... So there are situations where your ethics and your morals can conflict. I mean, it's just like at the same time, um, I think there's another example, um, kind of the adverse effect. Um, we know that doctors take what's called the Hippocratic Oath, which the first line says to do no harm. That's their professional, professional code of conduct. Every doctor has to take that oath. And that's the first line in it. I mean, this goes all the way back to, I mean, Greek days, way back. That's where the Hippocratic Oath came from. And that very first line says, to do no harm. Well, if I'm to do no harm, and yet um, I'm performing abortions, my ethical code of conduct says to do no harm, but I've decided within my heart that abortion's not murder, and so now my ethics and my morals are conflicted. Okay, so now this is where we come into a real problem with situational ethics. Um, but ethics is the key to our understanding of our relationship, both divine and human. Um, if a man is not responsible to God or to love God, then where does he get his ethical guidance? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's why we see so many problems in society today. I just like you, you look around, I mean, in the past two weeks, I've had to run four people off here from the church four times in the last two weeks getting here. And there's homeless people either sleeping in the doors, doorways. Uh, we actually had one in the back closet, broke in the door. <laughs> scared, scared me to death. <laughs> I went to open the door. I had no idea it was in there. I mean, I went to open the door. The door was kind of messed up and everything. And I pulled the door and it popped open and everything. I was like, okay, well, that was weird. Then the lights were on inside. I was like, well, somebody must have left the lights on. I'm thinking they were getting ready for youth conference. Somebody left the lights on, so I went to push the door to open up the garage door so I could get the uh, golf cart out so I could put my cones. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy moving down. And I'm like, he's down there cooking. I mean, he's just completely ignoring me. And I'm just like, uh, excuse me, <laughs> can I help you? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just cooking dinner. I'm fine. <laughs> no, no, I need you to go. Um, yeah, it's just like uh, the, ne the very next morning, I had one in the front door sleeping right there. It's just like I had to wake him up, say, hey, you got to go. We got kids on the property, can't have you here. Uh, this morning again, another one out back sleeping in front of the door. I mean, it's just like four times in the past two weeks. We have a societal problem because there's no ethics. Um, society, it's just like we have a problem. I mean, if, there, if there's no... Uh, well, what, what I call prescriptive rules. If there's no rules, how does that affect our relationships with other people? I mean, relativism or, you know, relativism or situational ethics puts me first. Okay, and, and if I'm first, then too bad for you. I mean, I... I I mean, it's just, it's been, there's been a few times I've had to run people off in the morning. I had one guy get mad. He got mad at me because he was sleeping out here in the front side over here where the, and it's just like, he got mad at me. I mean, he literally got mad at me. He's like, why, why can't you just leave me alone? Why can't you just, I'm like, sleeping in a place you're not, not supposed to be. It's just like, and so it's just like, when we start looking at, you know, ethics from a personal perspective, well, if my ethics are different than your ethics, whose ethics trump the other. We got a problem. Um, but here, here's the interesting thing is there's those people who believe in what we call situational ethics actually believe they're doing good for society. Hmm. How many millions of babies aborted in the past? Um, I mean, we, we look at the, 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 the subjects, the big subjects, transgenderism. How many kids have been hurt by this? That's situational ethics. That's situational ethics. That's, that's not a moral high ground. We're hurting children, okay? Um, 
So it's just like, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I, I came across this, Martin Luther King Jr. said, the first question which the priest and Levite asked, if I stop to help this man, what's going to happen to me? So again, they put themselves first, right? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question and says, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? Okay, the priest and Levite, honestly, they represent relativism. You know, it's me first. And, you know, so what's good for me, uh, too bad for you. Because, honestly, in that situation, we know that we're familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, those two passed by and left him sitting in the ditch. Um, and situ situational ethics says that's okay. He probably deserved to be there. Mm, that's a problem. Okay. Um, so with you know, regards to these two philosophies, I think we understand which is the most beneficial for society. It's just like I was listening to the radio the other day. They were talking about uh, homelessness. That's what it was. They were talking about homelessness, and they were talking about new shelters opening up for people to stay in. And here's the thing. All of those new shelters that opened up, guess who they were run by? Churches. Because churches have a moral and ethical guide to help those who are in need of help. Okay? Um, all, all situational ethics can do is just like look at the problem and go, we don't know what to do. I mean, that's why we have such a big problem here in Portland, Vancouver, the area. I mean, it's just like we have such a homeless, such a huge homeless population because they don't know what to do. Well, we know what to do. We need to help them. Um, yeah, so I just kind of want to look at five flaws with, with <laughs> relativism, and then we'll look at five truths of a Christian perspective. Relativists cannot accuse each other of wrongdoing. Because if I decide what's right for me, I have no right to tell you what's right or wrong. Because it's situational ethics. Um, <laughs> that leads to a lawless society. Uh, it's just like every time there's a protest... And we start breaking car windows and store windows and, well, I have a right to do that. I'm protesting. Um, you, you don't, you don't, uh, with that kind of a thought, I don't get to accuse anyone of anything. How do, how do they, how do they determine what is right and what's wrong? Because they're basing it upon each individual situation. So it's just like, uh, we got problems now. Um, <laughs> if I believe that morality is based upon a personal definition, then I surrender the right of making good objective decisions. Um, technically, they can't object to anything. Because in my situation, I determine what's right. And, and you don't get to tell me what's right or what's wrong. I mean, that's, that's why we're in the situation where, I mean, it's just like, I can't believe this actually happened um, in our country. And it was the Supreme Court. Um, I hate to think of it. Child pornography is legal. Yeah, it's legal. You can own it as long as you don't produce it or sell it. You're giving me a funny look on your, your face because you're going, well, then where do they get it from? Somebody had to produce it and somebody had to sell it, right? But the, the, the ACLU fought for this. The ACLU, mm, ACLU, don't get me started. The ACLU fought for this saying that, that, that child porn is an expression of art. Yeah, this is an expression of art. It's an art form. They said, as long as you're not producing it, as long as you're not selling it, it's okay. But somebody has to produce it and somebody has to sell it. But this is situational ethics. I mean, if, if we start going down that path, we could excuse anything. And, and they are. Um, and so it's just like, so we have this big problem. I mean, right and wrong are a matter of personal choice. But if we are certain some things are wrong, doesn't that throw out relativism? I mean, because, there's, I mean, because they'll tell you, well, no, murder's wrong. 
But if you're saying it's situational, then you don't get to make that determination. Because what if I had a good reason for murdering somebody? So they have a problem with that. There's your, there's your first flaw. It's just like, throw it out. Um, relativists can't complain about the problem of evil. Well, actually, they don't even believe in evil. Evil is just a construct of the mind. Remember that? We talked about that before, but yeah. Um, if true evil exists, okay, um, then there can be no moral value related to the observer. Relatives, it, it's inconsistent with the idea of the true evil. Um, I found this, it, it's, it's called history, religion, and truth. Um, evil is the word we use to describe those circumstances that impede our desires unjustly and is caused by another person or persons. If we are hungry and a person who has plenty eats a hamburger in front of us without sharing, is this petty evil or is it just bad manners and rude? But then it goes on to say, why is genocide a great evil if all of us must die anyway? That's scary. That's a little bit scary. But then the death penalty is somehow not evil? Uh, evil is a point of view relative to one's desire. So like I said, you can excuse any kind of behavior with that philosophy. Um, if there's no moral standard, then there can be no departure from that standard. I mean, and there are people that believe that genocide is actually a good thing because we have too many people on earth anyway. So let's just get rid of some. I mean, isn't that what euthanasia is? Trying to get rid of the old people? Get to a certain age, we don't need you anymore. You're no longer a productive person of society, so we should just get rid of you. There should be no moral objection, right? They're going to die anyway, according to them. Okay? Um, we talked about this. I mean, they say that, that evil is just a construct of the mind. I mean, if that's really true, if evil is just a construct of the mind, then why do we have laws at all? There is no evil. If, if evil is just a, a construct of our mind, it's not really there, then why do we have laws? What are we trying to govern? So we got this idea that, you know, this ethical idea or the, uh, this relativist idea that, you know, evil doesn't exist. And so it's just like we have a problem with that. Um, they can't place blame or accept praise. Um, those concepts are meaningless. Because if, they, if there's no external measure or standard of what should be applauded or condemned then how do you give praise? How do you condemn? I mean, it's just like, it's, it makes no sense. There's no absolutes. That's the problem with situational ethics is there's no absolutes. Everything, everything is a gray area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they are perfectly willing to pat themselves on the back, but if that's the truth, then they're not a true relativist. They're not a true situational ethicist. Eth ethicist. It's just like, I, there's nothing good, there's nothing honorable, there's nothing bad. I mean, and so since morality is just fake, we got a problem. If the notion's ideas of praise and blame are valid, then their relativism is false. Um, relatives can't improve their morality because they have none. I mean, seriously. I, if there's no measure, if there's nothing to measure against, how do I know, how do I know if I'm improving or not improving. There's no measure. I mean, it's just like I can measure against myself, but is that a real good measure? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> how do they measure that? I, well, I'm a better person now. Well, what did you do? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm a better person. Uh, yeah, it just doesn't work. Uh, they, they can't hold meaningful moral conversations. What is there to talk about? Because what I decide is right might be different than what you decide is right. So can we really have a moral conversation? Uh, I think we have a problem here. It's less of a conversation more of who can yell louder. Yeah, less of a conversation of who could yell louder, right? Um, well, then this is what they say. Well, it's wrong to push your morality on other people. Ooh, now I have a problem with that. 
because they do nothing but preach tolerance. And yet, whoo, you talk about the attacks on Christians these days. It's okay. Right. And so it's just like, I mean, it's interesting doing some of this research. I was reading this one article. And, you know, I punched in the, the computer, doing a lot of Google searches and things like that about, you know, Christian attacks in the United States. And, and somebody actually said, well, there's no Christian attacks in the United States. It's just not happening. Wow. Yeah. yeah it's just like, I mean, what, are they not paying attention? Um, and, and I don't see it. I mean, there are physical attacks, but I mean more of a political sense. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think we talked about this, I think, in one of the first lessons, uh, New York City. They banned storefront churches because they didn't want the churches to have the tax-free locations, and so they banned storefront churches. They changed the law, changed the law to ban storefront churches and then kicked them all out. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it, it's little things like that that we, people don't see. They say, well, that's not really persecution or, Really? I mean, what were they doing that was wrong? You know, so it's just like, I mean, so we have this, this, this problem with, with their, their situational ethics. I mean, there's, moral, there's no moral discourse, I mean, because you can't. Um, so, you know, we'll put that aside. We'll look at the, the five truths of Christian ethics. Christian ethics is based on the Bible, okay? Uh, Christian ethics is based on the Bible. Uh, one of the purposes of the Bible is teaches how to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, For this cause also, since the day we have heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Um, the Bible is the higher authority on ethics simply by the fact that it's the word of God and creation belongs to him. Okay? Now they'll deny that, of course, but I mean, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay? Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Because he is creator and stainer, he holds the authority on all things. So there is an ethical standard. It's God. And it's God's word. And he gave us this ethical standard. He gave us the commands. He gave us... Like I said, the two highest commands is love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. Those are the two highest laws of the land, or they should be. That's what Jesus said. Okay, um, Because he's the creator and sustainer, he has the authority on all things. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. So by him... Were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Basically it's saying he is the authority on all things, including ethics. Um, the word of God is the authority on our ethics. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or perfect, uh, th truly furnished unto all good works or good works. Um, he gives us four areas. He first says, Scripture is profitable for doctrine, which is teaching. It teaches us what's right. That's ethics. It teaches us what's right. He says, Second, Scripture is profitable for reproof or rebuke. That teaches us what's wrong. Ethics. Okay. Third, it says that Scripture is used for correction. It teaches us how to get right. Still ethics. And then fourth, it tells us profitable for training or instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. Again, ethics. Okay. What's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay wrong. Um, secular philosophy is based upon self-determination. There's no higher authority than me. Well, I've decided... Since I'm only five foot four, 
anybody over 5'6 has to die. Because I, yeah, you're just going, shrink it down. Because I'm the authority. I've decided. That, that, those are situational ethics. I've decided with tall people, you eat too much food, you breathe up too much air, you're too, you, 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 you got to go. A small, peop, a small people were taking over the world. Situational ethics. I mean, why not? Makes sense to me. No, see, Christian ethics teaches that there is a higher authority, okay? And that higher authority provides with the foundational principle on how we should live in this world. That's what I'm saying. It's just like, this way. Both sides can argue there's the better way, but how is that determined? And we'll say, they say, well, no, our, our way's better, and they would know our way's better. Well, as a Christian, how do we measure that? Well, we look at relationships. That's the key. We all have to live on this earth together, Right? I mean, we have to find some way to get along or to live. I mean, we don't isolate ourselves. I mean, we, you could. I mean, you could go up into the mountains and become a hermit. But we live on this world. We, we function together, so relationships are key. And that's why we come back to those two highest commands. Matthew chapter 22, again. Uh, Master, which is the great commandment in the law. What's the most important law? He was asking Jesus, what is the most important law? Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy mind, with all of thy strength. He says, and the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Everything's dependent upon those two things. So what do we have to do? We have to live in a way and strive to live in a way that is pleasing to God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that have you received us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. So there is a measure. Okay? Um, and how do we do that? Um, by following the most ethical person that ever lived, Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him ought also himself to walk even as he walked. He's the example. Um, how did he walk? Well, John chapter 8, verse 29 said, Then Jesus to them, When you have uh, lifted up the Son of Man, you shall know that I am he, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not let me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He established the ethical guidelines. He's the one that we follow. So you start off with a foundation that's found in the Word of God. The second, the ultimate basis for Christian ethics is the moral character of God himself. Okay, um, God's moral standards for human beings come from his own moral character. Uh, so they apply to all people in all cultures for all history. Uh, the moral standards that are part of his nature. It's, it, this is something that God adopted. It's just who he is. Okay? And those are the things that he gives to us and commands us to follow. Uh, what's the first thing? God is love. And so what does he do? He commands us to love. Um, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Um, so as Christians, we can love the unlovable. Uh, the one I left, left this morning. He was sleeping in the back doors. He was actually nice. I got into the golf cart and pulled around and said, Hey, I need to get your attention here. He's like, what, what? So we got kids coming into school. I need you to leave the property. He's like, oh, okay, okay, no problem, no problem. He got up, got his stuff together, started walking out, and he actually thanked me. <laughs> and so I was just like, okay. And so he's got a good attitude. So I went back to him, gave him a gospel track, and gave him a couple bucks and said, hey, go get something to eat. He didn't smell good. Okay. Probably hadn't showered in who knows how long. You know, he, uh, he had, uh, I don't even know if they're called dreads. I mean, his hair was just like matted. I mean, long. And he's just like matted together. It's just like, 
It, it didn't look like he had been, slept anywhere but outside for the past month. So what do you do? You share the gospel with him. That's what you do. Now, situational ethics would say, ew, gross, get away. You don't measure up to the standard that I've set for myself, so go away. So who has the better result in society? Situational ethics, which puts themselves on a higher plane, or the Christian who follows God's example. Because Jesus came to this earth to die for that guy. So where's the measure? Okay, um, So he says he's commanded us to love because he loves. They can't love the unlovable. Um, we believe in what's called unconditional love. God loved me even though. Okay. I don't necessarily like that term unconditional, but it's kind of the idea is there that, that God loves us even though we are who we are. God loved that guy this morning. Even though, well, situational ethics goes, no, 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 he needs to improve and then we'll love him. How does he improve? What if his situational ethics says, I'm fine the way I am? Who gets to determine? So we love because he loved us. The um, Bible says that he is holy and he commands us to be holy. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, But as he which is called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Um, he doesn't just give the command. He's the example. Okay, um, He's merciful. So he commands us to show mercy. Now Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Um, you know, they have a problem with that. Uh, situational ethics has a problem with that. Um, they cannot extend mercy to somebody that is to live by their standard. They won't show mercy. Okay? Um, <laughs> again, this goes back to that idea of tolerance. Um, you look at their attitude towards Christians. Uh, back in April, actually March, April of this year, the, the shooting in Tennessee, the transgender that went into the Christian school and shot up the school. Um, surprisingly, Newsweek, April 4th, 2023, not exactly a Christian publication, Newsweek came out and said, um, this was the title, Acceptable Hate, Assaults on Christianity Go Overlooked. But this is what they wrote. It says, following the tragic events in Nashville, left-wing journalists, columnists, entertainers, and activists directed their ire towards Christians and conservatives rather than mourning the victims and condemning the violence. They actually applauded this transgender person for going into a Christian school and shooting people because she was fighting for her rights. Newsweek actually condemned it, said instead of offering sympathy and support, they made callous remarks that only mocked the Christian faith, but also blamed the victims themselves. They blamed children in this Christian school for this transgender person going in and shooting them. It was their fault. Because they had an ethical position that said that transgenderism is wrong. So it was their fault that they got shot. This is what most of the news media was saying. But we preach tolerance. We say every person has the right to exist and believe what they want. No, that's not what they believe. Okay? Uh, said this cold-hearted response exemplifies the escalating hostility towards Christians, which in ideological battle eclipses empathy and compassion. Yeah, it's just like they, they talk about you know, being tolerant, but they are not tolerant. Not at all. If you disagree with them, they just as soon shoot you as do anything else. They don't want to have a discussion. They don't want to have any kind of a discourse to, to, to come to some kind of a, a common ground. They don't want that. When it comes to Christianity, they want you just to, to close your mouth. Stop forcing your agenda, which we're not. All we do is we preach the gospel. 
but they're going to force that. Um, we go on. His character, he's truthful, and he commands us not to lie. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, Titus chapter 1, verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God cannot lie. And that Exodus chapter 20, verse 16 says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Hmm. Brian Hegland uh, said, It's okay to lie as long as you reach a higher truth doing it. It's okay to lie. Uh, so where do we draw the line? So i got some situations for you. A man lies to his wife about where they're going for dinner because when they get there, there's a surprise birthday party there. Is that an okay lie? Technically, no. But do we do it? Sure thing. Um, here's another one. A young child is rescued from a plane crash. Very weak, injured. Parents died in the crash, but he doesn't know that. He asks about his parents, and the doctor that's taking care of him says that his parents are okay, planning to tell him the truth later. Do we lie or not? Okay, this, this is what I'm talking about. Situational ethics would say, yeah, go ahead and lie. Okay, um, A woman's interviewing for a job, small company. Okay, uh, she's asked, "Do you plan to have children?" Believing that she says, "Well, it's none of your business," she believes she won't get the job, so she lies and says, "No, I'm not planning on having a family." You could word that differently. You could word it differently. <laughs> my current plan. My, yeah, my my current plan is to yeah, and so it's just, guys, we face this every day. Let's be honest. I mean, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we call them the little white lies, you know. I mean, we, we might do it to protect somebody's feelings. You know, we might do it to, you know. I, yeah, you, here's the problem. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That whole verse kind of talks about, you know, um, <laughs> The wife asked the husband, hey, honey, does this, does this dress make me look big? What do you say? Yeah, it's a, it's a no-win situation for the husband, I'll just be honest with you. It's, it's like the other one. No, the other one I like is just like, hey, have you stopped beating your children yet? Have you stopped beating your children yet? Can you answer that question? Well, if you say yes, then that means you used to beat your children. But if you say no, you're still beating your children. So how do you lie to get out of that situation? You're just like, they're not my children. <laughs> they're somebody else's children. I don't beat my own children. I beat other people's children. It's just like, but guys, I mean, God's moral character says, you tell the truth. That's what that verse is talking about. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You be honest. You're honest with people. It's just like, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It says, but... The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Yeah. Your friends will appreciate you more. Right. Yeah, we need somebody to be honest with us. I was just like, yeah. Um, yeah, so God's moral character is given this fact that he commands, provide the basis for us to answer the question, how can we move from what we should do to what we ought to do, what is to, you know, it's just like, so um, Christian ethics. Um, so Christian ethics has been essential to the proclamation of the gospel. We need ethics to be able to present the gospel because here's the thing. Um, true Christian ethics don't deny sin. They pre proclaim that there has to be a repentance of sin. Uh, ooh, more and more we're seeing in churches, even in Christian churches, the watering down of sin. It's, it's just interesting. People don't like that word. Sin. Can't you call it something else? Well, the, the idea is, well, you know, just believe in Jesus and everything's fine. 
Is it really? Yeah, you just believe in Jesus, but nothing he ever, he ever said, right? Um, Jesus made it very clear repentance of sin is key, key to salvation. Without repentance, the Bible says there's no remission of sin. Um, Jesus, when he started his ministry, Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 50, says, Now after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. First thing Jesus said was repent. Um, I, I struggle a little bit with the way some people present salvation. I get concerned when we put too much emphasis on the avoidance of hell and not the repentance and absolution of sin. Jesus did not come into this world to save you from hell. Jesus came into this world to save you from sin. Okay? Um, Acts chapter 13, verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, not the avoidance of hell. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe that hell is a real place. Yes, but that's not the reason we get saved. We don't get saved so that we don't have to go to hell. We need to get saved because we have sin. That's the key. And sometimes I think we put too much emphasis on the hell piece of it, and we forget about the sin part. Um, in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I mean, it's just like I was doing some research on the word sin. Sin, sins, sinner, sin, uh, anything that's in that form of sin, and it appears over, well over 250, to, to almost 300 times in the New Testament alone. But yet we want to talk about avoiding hell. I believe that, that that kind of a presentation of the Gospels many times gives people a false sense of security. Um, the benefit of repentance and belief is new life. Okay? I mean, without ethics, where is sin? If there's no sin, where is repentance? Okay? Uh, take away biblical ethics and you remove sin. And the gospel becomes of no effect. Uh, anonymous. That guy writes a lot. Says you have to admit you're broken before you can be made whole. Um, Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Say, when I got saved it was not because I was afraid of hell. That was not why I got saved. I got saved because I hated my sin. And I didn't know how to get rid of it until the gospel was repented. Is the, the childish desire to avoid consequences as opposed to changing behavior to make yourself more glorified? That's right. I mean, it, it, that, it, that, that's a great perspective. That's a great, great way to describe it. Yeah, I mean, who, who doesn't want to avoid hell? So I, 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 this, I know this is not a popular subject, especially in this church. I know a lot of people use hell as a way to present the gospel. I don't. I, I, I try to refrain from using hell as a fear tactic because it, it, it's not fear that causes us to repent. It's guilt, it's conviction that causes us to repent. Fear doesn't last. Um, like I said, I didn't get saved because I was afraid of going to hell. I got saved because I hated my sin and I was tired of it. I was tired of living the life of a drug addict. And so I repented of my sin in hopes of giving me a new life and he did. Okay? Um, it was just like, the old song, what a wondrous message in God's word. My sins are blotted out, I know. That's the key. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, without ethics and without sin, then where's salvation? Where's the gospel? It becomes of no effect. Um, Christian ethics teaches that the truth of sin. Um, some Christian philosophers claim that we only face impossible moral conflicts when all of our choices are sinful. And when this happens, we just have to choose the lesser sin. <laughs> Slippery slope. 
uh, nowhere in the Bible is sin ever permitted for the believer. Notice what I said, for the believer. Okay? Um, people will give you the Rahab argument. What's the Rahab argument? She lied. When the king sent soldiers to her house and said, hey, where are the men that came in and were spying out the land? She knew they were up on the roof, and she lied. She says, oh, I don't know, they must have left. She lied. So they say, see, God approved of her lie. Wait a minute. There's problems with that. Number one, Rahab was not a child of God. She was a Canaanite prostitute. She had no moral teaching of God. So you can't place that on her and say that she lied and that God accepted. Number two, she responded not out of conviction, but out of fear. That she knew. She, they had all heard. All of Jericho was living in fear. They had heard everything that was happening with God's people and everything. They were living in fear, so she responded out of fear to save her own skin, not to show any kind of moral respect towards God. So that argument doesn't work. And then third, uh, the Bible never, never approves of her action. It does not say that Rahab lied and it's okay. Because, well, she had good reason. It does not say that. It does not lift her up as an example of good moral behavior. It doesn't. And so it's just like, so to kind of use that argument kind of fails a little bit. People say, well, but, but people lied in the Bible, but never was it accepted or approved of? Okay, um, Who's the example? Jesus. Jesus never sinned. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, but without sin. Every sin you can imagine, Jesus faced it. And then, But God gives us a promise that when we face temptation, there's always a way to escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 is one of the first verses I learned after I got saved. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above the you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. I always use the example of Joseph when Potiphar's wife kept pestering him and kept pestering him and kept pestering him. Finally, they were alone in the room. What did he do? He ran away. Run away from sin. Trying to use that with fourth grade. When you feel like you want to talk, out of turn, run away from the sin. It's not working very well. <laughs> Come on. But there's, there's no excuse for us saying, well, you know, it's just I mean, you just can't help it. It's who I am. No, it's not who you are. If you've accepted Christ, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Uh, the uh, um, willful sin brings very harmful consequences to our daily life. Sin's not a popular topic these days, less and less being preached from the pulpits of America. People just don't want to hear it. They want that good, make me feel good preaching. Like I said, over 250 times, almost 300 times in the New Testament, you find those words, that word sin. That doesn't even include words like uh, iniquity, uh, unrighteousness. I mean, that's just the word sin. What's so? I mean, that's pretty, something pretty big just to ignore. Sin has consequences. It has consequences. Um, it disrupts your fellowship with God. Uh, Ephesians chapter four verse thirty says, "Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption." Yes, yeah, sin will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It breaks that fellowship. Uh, Isaiah chapter fifty nine verses one and two. Let's see if I can get there quick. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is your heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin will always break that fellowship with God. It doesn't break the relationship, but it breaks that fellowship. Like, the Lord's hand is not short. No T-Rex arms that he cannot save. 
He's not deaf. He can hear you. That's not the problem. The problem is your sin. That's what prevents him from hearing. Okay, So it breaks the fellowship with God. Um, we're in danger of discipline from the Father. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, You have forgotten the exhortation which speak unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, for in a faint when thou art rebuked of it. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. I mean, we are in danger of being punished when we sin. It's actually a good thing. That's what brings us back onto the path and teaches us those ethics. What's right? What's wrong? How to get right? Um, we see a decline in our ability to serve successfully. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except you abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So we have to strive to live in a way that avoids sin against God and our fellow man. That's why we have these ethics. It's why we believe the Bible is the sole foundation and authority for what we do and how we act. Without it, chaos. Which is when you look around, that's what we have now. We have chaos in our society because there is no measure. It's a dangerous place to be. Um, here's the good news. If we do sin... We can go to God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the measure. There's the ethics. So, we get pretty obvious where we stand. <laughs> Situational ethics, dangerous. It really is dangerous. We have to follow a Christian principle that's been established by God and by God's Word. Very simple. All right, homework, the next lesson, which is not next week, it will be in two weeks. Uh, we are going to look at salvation, but it might not be in the way you think. Um, it's called soteriology. The worldview includes a salvation story, okay? But when we hear the word salvation, we think automatically of salvation from sin, death, hell, through the atoning work of Jesus. But when we talk about salvation, this is more generic. Um, what is the basic human problem? And what's the solution to that problem? Hmm. Because a secular worldview has a totally different perspective than we do. So we'll talk about salvation in two weeks. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that you do give us a standard, a measure that we can follow and we can live by. It's one that was established by you and by your own uh, character and moral behavior. Lord, I pray that you'd give us strength to stand and stand on truth. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.